Okay, that was good. Worship was so good. You know, during worship, I, I kept hearing the phrase out of uh, Revelation 4, come up here and I'll show you what's going to occur next. Right. And I believe that that is where we are, that Lord is revealing to us what is occurring. And this morning, we're going to talk about uh, how the devil is lying to us. He is a liar. He is a liar. He is lying to us. And uh, he is lying to us through forms which we don't always connect to being the author of lies. He's lying to us through the media who has been deceived. He's lying to us through uh, this COVID that is ravishing our world. He is using the things around us to dissuade us, to discourage us, to delusion us, to keep us from believing, even though we know that the word of God is true. And it doesn't matter what lie is spun, the word of God trumps it every time. And I I did talk about this a little bit last week, but we're going to talk about it some more because I feel like as the body, we have got to flex our muscles by knowing the word and declaring the word over anything that sets itself up against the truth of God. Like Jean said, there is some facts, and then there's the truth. And only God's word is true. And everything we hear, everything we say, everything we do must be measured against the truth of the word. And if it is not, then we, at times, are lured in to being distributors of the lie. And we, as the body of Christ, cannot be in agreement with what the enemy is spreading we cannot be in agreement and i feel such a passion about this um it just burns inside of me because i you know i do read things i read the newspaper i read the well i don't read the newspaper i glance at the headlines uh i i do have one paper that i read regularly the wall street journal every day but I glance at the headlines, I see what's being posted, and I always fact check. If I see something that's posted, I always fact check it. Because a lot of times, hey, Eddie, will you turn the outsides off for me, please? A lot of times, what is posted is not true, or it's only a partial quote of something. And if you actually do the research, it's completely out of context, so it's actually not true. Right. And not everybody has time to fact check. Sometimes I send it to someone else to do the fact checking for me, but we have got to be responsible for what the word says yeah. and what comes out of our mouth. And it's just critical at this time. There's a couple of scriptures I'm going to read. We're going to end up in 2 Kings, so you can go ahead and turn there if you want, there, if you want to. But... Um, this Psalms 119, when I do premarital counseling, uh, it takes a long time. I always tell people, if you're asking me to marry you, we're in it for the long haul because it's not going to be next week because uh, we have to do premarital counseling. And I actually love doing it. Uh, there's a few people that have been through my process and uh, they may not be agreeing with the love of doing it, but they do it. But what I find is... I always make them read Psalms 119. Every week they'll take a section of Psalms 119. I'll give it to them. And then they have to come back and share with me what is God saying to them? What does the word mean? All that. And the thing about Psalms 119, it basically, I mean, I know it's long, but it basically sums up the word of God. And that's why I love it, because it it, it challenges them to dig in and think about what is it they believe. So one of my favorite scriptures in Psalms 119 is Psalms 119.89. And this is kind of where we're going to land, even though it's going to be in 2 Kings. It says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. It is settled. Oh, how I love your law. It is, the medita- it is my meditation all 
all day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies. It is the word of God that makes us wiser than our enemies. It makes us wiser than any demonic strategy, plan, uh, uh, thought process that he has. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for your words are always with me. So when we have the word of God entrenched, permeated within us, then it gives us the wisdom to defeat anything the enemy wants to bring against us. Amen? Amen. I, I want agreement. I, I want to see some mat running on this. No, I'm too... <laughs> because what we do is, you know, we're talking about a plumb line. God's word is the plumb line. And you know what a plumb line is? You know, when they're, when they're doing construction, they'll take the little uh, chalk cord. It's usually purple or red, or something like that. They'll pull it, and it does a line against the wall, or it does a line against whatever. God's word is our plumb line, and everything has to line up. Uh, it, it has to come level with the word. So whatever we do, whatever we say, has to be measured against the plumb line. And we talked about a little bit of this on Thursday night, is that our words have to be measured. We have to be careful in what we say. We cannot be uh, loose with our tongue because we don't want to empower the kingdom of darkness in any way. We don't want to empower him. So 2 Kings 2 and we're going, to read, we're going to read through quite a bit, so sit back, relax, take your shoes off. You know, we're going to stay a while. It's like the Beverly Hillbillies. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Come on, we're going to stay a while. I know Jean talked about September being a season of, of, of launching, of releasing, and the Lord actually has been talking to me about that too, not specifically to September, but we're moving into a new era of power and authority. We're moving into a new era where as we speak, heaven agrees, and the activation is there. Right. We're moving into a whole different era because God is sending forth his people to break the assignment of the enemy. And he needs us as his people to know the word so through and through within us that what we see, we're able to align with God and act on his behalf. Now, we've always been doing that. You know, when we become born again, we, we receive the spirit within us. Our alignment becomes with God. We become transformed from glory to glory, all of those different things. But we are moving into a level of greater responsibility. A greater responsibility for our day-to-day, -day, our hour-to-hour, -hour, our minute-to-minute -minute response to what's going on. And, okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to breathe on that one. I was just going to say something. I was like, you know, sometimes we have to self-edit in the middle of talking, right? <laughs> just relax, God says. Okay, so we're going to talk about some situations that Elisha went through and how they differ and how God empowered him to respond to them. And these situations can be translated to our day and time. Yeah, I've had people come to me and say, well, the word doesn't say anything about X. Well, that's not really true. The word says something about everything. Yeah. Everything we face, the word says something about it. Yeah. It, might, it may not say car, it may say camel. But the word say, it says something about our transportation. It says something about our debt. It says something. God's word says something about every single thing we face. And it's a matter of harvesting the word based on the situation right. we have to harvest the word yeah. and we know that if we go to god and say god we need a solution he will give us the solution yeah. he will because his word says 
Come to me. Call to me. Ask me. And I'll show you. I'll tell you. So we have to know that when we go to him, we will receive an answer for it. For whatever it is. So Elisha has received a double anointing from Elijah. And he picks up the mantle of Elijah and hits it on the banks, strikes the water, and activates the anointing that God has given him. So he activates what's being done. And then we're going to go to 2 uh, Kings 2, verse 19. Then the men of the city said to Elisha, Look, this city is in a pleasant place, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the land is barren. He said, Bring me a new jar. Now bring me something clean that has not been used and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then Elijah went to the spring of water and threw the salt in it and said, Thus says the Lord, I have purified and healed these waters. There shall, be, there shall no longer be death or barrenness because of it. So the waters have been purified to this day according to accordance with the word spoken by Elisha. Now, isn't that interesting? There's a couple things I want to point out here. First of all, the water was bad. It was causing barrenness and death. Because that's what the word says. So Elisha says, bring me a new jar and I'm going to put salt in it. He puts the salt in it and, and and then pours it into the water and the water is healed. Now, when we think about that, that is a creative solution to a problem. God gave Elisha, now think about how much salt do you need to pour to heal the water? That's my first thought. Wonder how much salt he had. You know, I have questions like that. I don't know about you guys, but I have questions. You know, I'm always like, huh, wonder how much water there was. You know, how, what needed to be healed. But, it, you know, those are the questions I have. And you guys may have other questions, but, but it's, the, it's the action that brought the healing. And, and, you, and God doesn't mind questions. He's not afraid of our questions. He may not have answers that he's going to reveal to us for every question that we have. Otherwise, we'd have a Q&A every day. You know, what about this guy? What? But what he does is he has that nudge to us that creates the momentum for us to respond to him, which creates the partnership the alignment with him so that the supernatural uh power of god hits the action of the human to bring forth the solution so think about that god partnered with elijah's obedience to bring a solution to the region's problem Now think about that. God partners with us in that way. He's looking for us to take the action that he's indicated. And it's funny, it doesn't say, in verse 22, it doesn't say in accordance with the word that the Lord spoke. It says in accordance with the word that Elisha spoke. God wants to use you to speak his word to bring a solution to the regional problem that you have. So what is the problem? God, what do you want me to do? And I will do it. Whatever we face, God has a solution for. Let's look at uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Now, I love this one. And uh, this is about the widow's oil, and I'm I'm sure you've all read it, but I'm going to read a little bit of it, because when the word of God is read, whether we read it in monotone, whether we read it in screaming excitement, it doesn't matter. The word of God is released. It activates heaven on our behalf. 
So, so you can sit, a lot of times I'll sit in my office and I will read the word out loud. Yeah. There's power in hearing yeah. the word out loud. Yeah. And there's clarity when you hear it out loud. I'm kind of a speed reader. So sometimes I read it out loud just to make sure I hit every word, I gather every understanding, because there's power in the release of the, of the word. It says, now one of the wives of a man of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha for help, saying, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. But the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So we have an issue of debt. Has anybody ever had an issue of debt? And they're in a situation where the provision that they had, which was her husband, the provision that they had had dried up. And the only option was the creditors were taking their sons. Because in that time, that was, you know, that was the exchange. Now think about this in our own lives. When financial um, issues occur because a provision that covered that, that financial part of it has dried up, what do we do? Elijah said to her, verse 2, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? She said, your maidservant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go borrow containers from all your neighbors. Empty the containers and not just a few. So all she has is oil. And to her, that is nothing. All I have is a small jar of oil. But to Elisha, there was the foundation for her to have provision. And he tells her, go borrow all the jars from your neighbors. And, um, but he says, go in and shut your door. And you and your son work in partnership with the anointing of God to bring provision to what you need. God wants to breathe on our situations. He wants to provide for us in a way that we wouldn't expect. And many times, you know, we think about his provision and we think it has to come as the, um, you know, publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes. That's the only way we're going to get it. We better sign up today. God is so much bigger than the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes. Come on. So she left him, shut the door behind her sons. This is verse 5. Uh, they were bringing her the containers as she poured the oil. When the containers were all full, she said to them, bring me another container. And he said to her, there is not one left. And the oil stopped. When she had what she needed, the supernatural multiplication stopped. Then she came and told the man of God, he said, go sell and pay your debt and you and your sons can live on the rest. God didn't give them just enough to cover their debt. God gave them enough to live. God gave them enough to live. God will give us more than we need in order to sustain us for what he has for us. And you know, the, the enemy would want to, want to tell us that we just need to turn our sons over. Let the debtors take our children. The enemy wants to tell us that our God is not big enough to provide the provision that we need. He is not big enough to come up with a creative solution for my financial situation to take care of where I've fallen short, to take care of the gap between the uh, positive and the negative. But those are the kind of things that we have to, remember I talked about super, being superimposed last week? That's when we, we lay out what we have and what we lack, and we lay the plan of God, the word of God over it, and see what the word of God has, his solution for our situation. And then we trust God to bring in whatever that solution is. He may bring it in by a new job. He may bring it in with a check in the mail. We've had some testimonies on that lately. I mean, we never know how he's going to bring it in, but his word says he will, and he will. Yeah. 
His word says that he is our provider, and he is. This should be very encouraging for us. Because what are we hearing now? We're hearing that our economy is in the tank. We're hearing that everything's failing. We're hearing that businesses are closing down. We're hearing that we're about to go through another rush of this. Who has the power to change that dialogue? Who has the power to change their declarations? We do. Because we have the power of God. We have his word to break off that assignment. To break off what's being said. Because what we're not hearing is that there were millions of jobs added back into the economy. That the unemployment fell from 22 to 11 percent. That's not what we're hearing. We're hearing, be worried. You're going to lose everything. Another wave is coming. Not on my watch. Because God is the one who's given me the power to break the strategy of the enemy against our country. And it starts in my house. It starts in my region. You know, everybody's worried about not having any coins. It's a big thing now. I don't know if y'all have seen it. There's, there's not enough change. <laughs> Physical change, like dimes. And well, I'm going to tell everybody, go into your closet and empty out your corn doors and take them out. We have a big corn jar to save my house. <laughs> Our son used to use it to save up for tennis shoes. Every so often, he would take it down to Publix, and they would do the count, and he would see if he'd have enough to buy a brand-new pair of basketball shoes because he played basketball. But, you know, I'm not worried about not having enough coins. God, if I need coins, then we just cancel that worry. They're here. It wasn't like they disappeared suddenly. We've always had it, so where are they? So what are they feeding me? They're feeding me a lie to come into agreement with, to wring my hands over. But God says, why are you worried about tomorrow? Today has its own problems. Trust me to take care of them. Yeah. If you think I'm going to clothe the, the flower, aren't I going to take care of you? Yeah. So I'm not worried about the coins. And Lord, if that's a coin issue, that's an issue for you, then tell me what to declare to break that stronghold of the enemy. That's what we have to do. We have to understand that we are strategists for God. Yeah. Yeah. We, we carry the strategy of heaven with us. And God wants us to release that strategy. And you're like, well, I don't have a strategy. It's all right here. Come on. I mean, if you don't think you have a strategy, if you, if you want a fresh word, there's many times I'm like, God, I want a fresh word. I want a prophetic word on that. It's in your Bible. Yeah. It's fresh. It's prophetic. Just release it. You know, and sometimes I'm hard-headed. I want God to, you know, I, I, want, a, I want a nice, hot, prophetic word off the press. It's right here. It's off the press. It is right here. I'm telling you guys, I feel like we got to throw the book at what's coming against us. If we throw the book of God at what's coming against us, then, then it can't survive. I remember our son telling us um, that he was in his French class who was taught by his German, a German teacher, and he was talking during class, and the teacher physically threw a book at him, and he quit talking. And, of course, now the, I'm sure the teacher would go to jail or something. I don't know. <laughs> but we told our son, you probably deserved it if you were being disrespectful. But, but you just think about it. Immediately, he quit, he quit talking. If we throw the book at what is coming against us, immediately, it has to bow to the name of Jesus. And when we think about it, we've got hundreds of thousands of people across our nation declaring and praying and, and breaking the assignment of the end. It has to bow. Yeah. You know, they want us to think we're in the worst place we've ever been. That is a lie from the devil. I am not in the worst place I've ever been. I'm in the best place because I'm in God. I'm in Christ. And there's nothing else that holds me back. That's where you are. So I am not believing the press. Unless it says Jesus is Lord, I am not believing it. Because they're filtering it through something else. 
And I am not believing it. And, and, you know, there are times, you know, when we talk about the Shulamite woman, and we're not going to, I'm not going to read all that right now, but we talk about the Shulamite woman in chapter five, and she is a woman who wants to honor Elisha. All she wants to do is honor him. Let me just take care of you. Let me just take care of you. And then he comes to her and asks his servant Gehazi, what is it she wants? What does she need? I don't need nothing. I don't need nothing. I don't want nothing. And Gehazi says, she doesn't have a child. She doesn't have a child. He says, okay, this time next year, you're going to have a child. There's power and authority in that word, right? And she said, don't lie to me. Her heart was broken because of not having a child. She said, don't you lie to me. But this time next year, she had a child. And the child grows a little, and then he dies. But what's interesting about this is she, get, she, get, she goes after him. And she goes, did I tell you don't mess with me? Have you ever had a woman tell you don't mess with me? That's serious stuff. That is serious stuff. All you guys who are married, that is serious stuff. But she goes to him, and she says, this is what's happened. And he says, the Lord didn't reveal it to me. So he didn't have a revelation of what was going on. So sometimes we don't actually have a revelation of what is going on. But we know who God is. And we know what his will is. Because we can find it within his word. So he goes and he's like, he tells her, you know, I don't know. There's been no revelation for me. But what I do know is I know God is a God of resurrection. I do know that I'm going to go in that door. He says, I go, he, in verse uh, 33, this is 2 Kings 4.33. Oh, we'll start in 32. He said, Elisha came into the house. The child was dead, lying on his bed. There's no cutting, cutting dice over that. Verse 33, he went in, he shut the door behind him, behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. It's interesting because the woman with the oil, she went in with her two sons and she shut the door. Sometimes that breakthrough comes between you and the Lord and the door closed behind you. It's that, it's that battle with no one around when no one's looking that gets you the breakthrough where you need to be. So he goes in and what I love about this is he, uh, he puts his, he goes in, lays on the child. The child gets a little warm. And then verse 35, he says, uh, he leaves the child and goes, walks around the house for a little bit. It says, then he returned and walked in the house once back and forth and then went up again and stretched himself out on him. And the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. And she says, call the Shulamite. And she came and picked up her son, and she fell at his feet, bowing down, I mean, bowing herself to the ground. Then she picked up her son and left. You know, sometimes there's that space between that intercession, right. that closed door with God, that, that unwillingness, you know, I, I, I got to find out what's going on. A lot of times when I'm writing a message, I'll spend time, I'll pray, I'll read and read and read, and then I'll go out for a walk. And it's, it's like as soon as I leave the space, all of a sudden, I'm like, I wish I had a pen with me. <laughs> all of a sudden, God's like, oh, and what about this? And what about that? And what about this? You know, but it's, it was, Elisha battled for that boy in a closed room. It was him and God and a dead child. And Elisha had no revelation on it. But he knew who God was. And he knew what God could do. So sometimes we don't have the, the revelation, the answer right on the tip of our tongue. But we know who God is. And we know his word speaks and breaks life. And sometimes we have to go in, we have to shut the door, and we have to wrestle for the breakthrough that we need. And God will give it to us. And the last little one I want to share, and I just, I just, I'm just give this briefly. Um, you know, I, I, sh I think we talked about this a little bit 
You know, if you go on and read the whole thing about Elisha, there was miracle after miracle. There was poisonous stew because someone made a mistake and put a poisonous vine in there. And, and God covered that mistake because Elisha just added a little flour and fed everybody. Right. Just a little flour kills the poison. <laughs> I'm going to have to remember that. <laughs> you might remember that, honey, when I'm cooking. But, you know, I was thinking there's one little uh, other little story about Elisha that is powerful. And, you know, they're about to be um, overrun. The enemies come against them. They're going to be overrun. And his servant is terrified. And he prays for his servant's eyes to be open, to be able to see into the spiritual realm. And what he sees is the angelic forces of God surrounding them. So they won't be defeated. But, and, and that's, you know, something we can always pray, just open up our spiritual eyes. But it goes on to tell that when the army came toward them, when the army came toward them, Elisha said, God, blind their eyes, and they were all blinded. Right. Then they brought them into the city, and they opened up their eyes. He said, open up their eyes again. He fed them. He gave them water to drink. And his men said, well, shall we kill them? Elisha's like, no. We're going to send them back to where they came. And they never came against the city again. And I, the only point I want to make here is sometime the strategy God has for the battle is different than the norm. Yeah. Sometimes he wants us to do something different in the encounter of our enemy right. in order to turn that enemy into an ally. And only God will be able to indicate to you when that time is. Because in the word, in other places, the enemy was completely destroyed. But, but there are times where God wants us to do things different. And we're in a time like this right now. When you read, if you go through and read all through Elijah, and I've read it over and over over the past week, everything he did was not the expected norm of what you would think. Like if someone was going to serve us poisonous stew we, stew, we knew it was poisonous, what would we do? We'd dump it out. God says, just throw a little flour in there. The water's barren. It's causing death. We're just going to toss a little salt in that one. Now, it doesn't mean we have a ministry of salt, a ministry of flour. It just means that we have to be adaptable to what God has for us. Not every situation will have the same answer. So we have to continue to press into the Lord and allow him to reveal this is the strategy for this time. Yeah. This is the strategy for an hour later, right. a day later, a week later. You know, even when David, when he, when he faced the Philistines, he kept asking God, God, do I go up? Okay, do it this way. Do I go up? Wait till you hear the sound of the troops in the... Uh, uh, balsam trees, you know, every time that's, that's where God is calling us. He's calling us to be in season, in every moment, in alignment with him. So whatever needs to happen, we are fully equipped with the power and authority to make it happen. So our words will not fall to the ground, just like Samuel's didn't. Our words will not fall to the ground because we're in such alignment. We're such in sync. We're such in oneness with God that we can see the situation, but we can hear from heaven and know what to do. And, and that is who we are. We are awesome people of God. I, I mean, we are just, I, I feel like God is like, now is the time. There's going to be a major shift for all of us. And uh, we're going to be like Elisha, taking that uh, mantle and slapping it to the ground and opening up the waters to do what we need for them to do. Uh, I'm going to end with this one scripture here, and then we're going to pray real quick. I want you to be encouraged today. Are you encouraged? Yes. I want you to be encouraged. Um, this is 2 Corinthians 10, and I'm just going to read uh, a couple of verses out of this. But 2 Corinthians 10, it says, Though we walk in the flesh, we are not carrying on our warfare according to the flesh. 
and using the weapons of man. So we're not going to win a war by this Facebook debate, Instagram debate. You know, we're not going to win a war by uh, the verbal uh, dance that we think we are. We're going to win the war by the power of the word of God coming out of our mouth yes. that will break the chain that's coming against us. It says, we are destroying. Oh, wait a minute, let me read verse four. The weapons of our warfare are not physical. Our weapons are divinely powerful yes. for the destruction of fortresses. Yes. And right now we've got some fortresses built in our nation. Right. And, and we're going to tear those fortresses down. And number five, verse five, it says, we are destroying sophisticated arguments and every exalted and proud thing. We are destroying it. Yeah. We say, I am. I am. We are destroying it. And every exalted and proud thing that sets itself against the true knowledge of God. We are taking every thought and purpose captive to the obedience of yeah. God. Yeah. That's who we are. Yeah. Being ready to punish every act of disobedience when your own disobedience is com own obedience is complete and that's where we are we are recalibrating ourselves to a uh, alignment with God that is so infused with authority and power revelation strategy all of the things that we need to defeat everything that has set itself up against the kingdom of God that's who we are and that's what we're going to see in the coming season. We're going to see a rise in the power of the people of God that will destroy the works of the enemy. And we've got to be willing to stand with courage and boldness and the strategy of heaven to break those things. Right. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Stand up. We'll pray. And uh, God is good. And he's going to take good care of us. He's going to use us powerfully. So, Father, your word says that we are going to pull down every argument. We're going to destroy every fortress that has set itself up against you, Lord. God, we declare today that those fortresses are already beginning to disintegrate. Yeah. God, we thank you that we have come together as one Christian body believer in you for our nation for our children god do you not think do we not think that you have the solution for our schools god you have the solution for what is gonna come in the future you have the solution for today for tomorrow you have solutions for this coronavirus you have solutions for uh, all the things that are being thrown at us finances economy lord we declare that our economy is in your hands. We declare that we're shifting the economic void into an economic abundance. We're declaring, just like the widow, that we have that small amount that you will breathe on, partner with us, and multiply in Jesus' name. Lord, we're declaring for the health for everyone who has faced, uh, whether it's COVID, whether it's something else, we declare for your health, just like with Moses, his eyes did not fail, his body would not give up. So Lord, we're declaring that anointing of that our bodies will not give up. They will be in strength, they will be in good health, that we'll have not only 2020 vision in the natural, but in the spiritual, Lord. We're just declaring that we're in agreement with what your word says. And we declare that the enemy is a liar. Yeah. And that every lie that he is fusing toward us, trying to uh, take our minds, take our uh, emotions, take our courage, uh, we, we just declare that they're revealed and we will rebuke them and renounce them as we see them. And that we will release the, the word of God over them, Lord. So, so right now, Lord, we just want to declare uh, just wholeness and health. Uh, just as 3 John 2 says, that uh, beloved, oh yes, Lord, thank you, God. 
that, that we just declare that we are in good health and that we prosper just as our soul prospers, which means that there's a healing that will go through all of us for our physical, our emotional, and our financial, uh, and our family, Lord. We just declare that over your people, over this nation, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you for our leaders, and we declare every leader that doesn't know you, we, we just declare them uh, a harvest time. We just, we, we agree with you for the harvest of their souls, that they will turn their heads away from uh, the enemy and turn them back to you, Lord. We just declare protection over our president, over his cabinet, over um, all of the government officials, over our states, Lord. God, we just thank you that uh, we're to pray for all those in authority so that there will be peace in our lives, Lord. So just thank you for that, Lord. And we just trust you for all that you have for us. And we thank you that your word is alive, it is living, it is active, and it is powerful to destroy all the works of the enemy. And we just thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Woo. Okay. Uh, we will be praying for people. You'll have to come up in a mask. We will wear a mask if you